The reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Our second scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. And if you wish to follow along in your pew Bible, even though the words are up on the screen, you can turn to page 1784 or 1783. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, begin at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the word Advent means to come. So let us pray now that the Lord will come. Uh, not only in this sermon, but in the communion that's going to happen after the sermon. So Lord, uh, uh, we forget about the true meaning of Advent sometimes, which means to come. And uh, we pray that the Lord will come amongst us right now as we um, share the word and as we uh, partake of the uh, Apostles' Creed and hear the choir minister to us and do the prayer of thanksgiving and uh, also then share in the meal that the Lord uh, ordained for us. We pray, let, Lord, that through all this that is going to occur right now, that the Holy Spirit will come into our hearts and impress upon all our hearts uh, the truths uh, that you have set aside for us uh, this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The late Harold Camping, an American preacher who um, use his radio ministry and thousands of billboards uh, to broadcast the end of the world. Uh, he, he broadcasted that the end of the world will come on uh, May 21, 2011. Harold founded the Family Radio Network in Oakland, California in 1958, and after that retired from engineering uh, to to preach in this ministry in 1961. And it became a service that was broadcast to uh, 140 uh, American and international uh, radio stations. And uh, Camping predicted that Judgment Day uh, will happen on May 21st, uh, 2011. 
and his independent Christian media empire spent millions of dollars to spread the word on more than 5,000 billboards and 20 trucks. And many of his followers actually quit their jobs and sold all their possessions to fund this billboard campaign. So, when Judgment Day did not happen on May 21, he kind of revised his prophecy, um, and he said that he had been off by five months. And so, uh, uh, unfortunately, he suffered a stroke three uh, weeks after May 21, 2011. Um, then when Judgment Day did not happen in October that he, that he predicted, uh, Camping acknowledged that his uh, apocalyptic prophecy uh, had been wrong, and he posted a letter on his website uh, telling uh, his, his followers that he actually had no idea as to when Jesus will return. And this is what he said. We realize that many people are hoping that they will know the date of Christ's return. We humbly acknowledge that we were wrong about the timing. And if you study the life of Harold, you will find that this was not the first time he predicted uh, uh, the exact date of Judgment Day. Uh, he did it bef uh, before on September 6, 1994. So in 1994 and 2016, he tried to predict uh, the Lord's second coming. Um, and then uh, Harold, the late Harold Camping went home um, on December 15, uh, 2013. Now, Harold Camping kind of demonstrates uh, one approach uh, towards Jesus' prediction of his second coming, something I called unhealthy speculation. Um, in the passage that Dan just read to us, there was this reference to learning the lesson from the fig tree, that when the fig tree's twigs become tender and leaves start coming out of that, you know that summer is near. Um, in other words, you know that Jesus uh, will come. Uh, however, I believe that when Jesus uses the fig tree illustration, he actually uses it as a metaphor, and that's what it should be. Yet, there are Christians who try to engage in unhealthy speculation and try to figure out when this fig tree will blossom, uh, figurative, uh, figuratively speaking, and, and how many leaves are fallen. And I really believe when I read that passage in Matthew 24 that Jesus intended this fig tree illustration to be a mere metaphor. But I think that when people engage in this un, uh, unhealthy uh, speculation, um, I, I wonder how biblical it is. Because later on in the passage that Dan um, reads for us just now, it, it says this, but about that day, and all hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So in terms of Jesus' second coming, not only, the, uh, not only does, do the angels not know about it, but Jesus himself does not know about it, let alone we as human beings try to predict exactly when Jesus will return. So I just wonder if if the activity of trying to uh, speculate the exact date of Jesus' return is indeed what I call a very biblical um, um, perspective of life. Um, I, I think, but, but by the same token though, I think that we should be expectant of Jesus coming again, and that's why we have the Advent season. I believe that the Advent season, and if you read about the Advent season historically, it was started by the church to focus on two comings, actually. The first coming and the second coming. And sometimes maybe we've tilted to the first coming, and hence that's why um, in the lectionary readings of today and last week, there was a focus on the second coming, which should also be a focus uh, for Advent. And so Jesus says, so you also must be ready, uh, because the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect Him. So therefore, for us to really figure out about the second coming, we should be expectant but we should not be engaged in what I call uh, unhealthy 
uh, speculation. So on the one side, you have unhealthy speculation, uh, you know, and when Camping put out his billboards, a lot of Christians were asked to give commentary on it. And many Christian leaders uh, from across the spectrum denounced Camping's practice and explained that they did not believe in Camping's uh, date. Uh, but there were other people who do not, uh, as, you, as some would say, who, who, who do not believe in Jesus, who criticize um, uh, camping, and they poke fun at his prediction, and a lot of people actually criticize that his followers spent millions of dollars trying to communicate uh, this particular idea that Jesus will come again on May 21st, uh, 2011. Now, I believe that uh, we also have the other extreme, um, and I think that there's a lot of people today who find it difficult to understand the person of Jesus Christ himself. And they will say to us, how can God have a son? How can a man claim to be risen from the dead? And even as we come to the Christmas season, how can God become a little born baby in a manger? It's illogical to me. So, for these people, uh, they have trouble uh, accepting that Jesus is the Son of God, let alone that he's coming back again. And so, therefore, there is this other idea, okay? There's unhealthy speculation about Jesus' second coming, but there is also a denial, a denial that uh, uh, he's coming again. Uh, or we live our lives as if Jesus is not coming again. And uh, it's interesting to note, and certainly for the last 10 years, I can testify to this, to this as a reality when I hear sermons, especially in the last two years uh, since I've been out of pastoral ministry and have been visiting churches. The idea of Jesus' second coming is hardly preached these days. In fact, the only time when uh, Christians even think about Jesus' second coming is in the Christian novels. Because, as you all know, there's this uh, novel series called Left Behind that has been made into a movie that is very popular. But it only exists in the Christian fiction, fictional world. Um, there's very little uh, acknowledgement these days on the pulpits that Jesus is coming again. And Jesus also refers to that denial uh, when he tells his followers just, that just as the day, in the days of Noah, uh, it will be at the second coming of the Son of Man. For in those days, as before the flood, people are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So there's this denial that you see within the church and outside the church about uh, Jesus coming again. And I found this statement by George Clooney, the actor, uh, this week as I was doing my research. And this is what uh, George Clooney says. I don't believe in heaven and hell, he says. I don't know if I believe in God. All I know is that as an individual, I won't allow this life, the only thing I know to exist, to be wasted. So this denial that we see uh, about Jesus' second coming is also a denial of Jesus' existence. And uh, there's this prevalent philosophy that we find in the world out there that it's only this life that matters. Forget about the afterlife. And it challenges us, this very, very, uh, this worldly focus, as they call it, life, is, is, is very real out there. And we come across this kind of people um, um, as we uh, go about our lives in the school, in the uh, office places, in our neighborhoods. And the idea is this, uh, as in the days of Noah, if you like, uh, we only have this life, so let's make a good, good thing out of it, okay? Let's eat, drink, and be merry, and not worry about tomorrow. And if I have to die, that's it. At least I've, I've had 
a good time of eating, drinking, and being merry. Let's, let's forget about it. About six years ago, um, I went for my normal checkup uh, with the doctor, and my PSA readings were pretty high, extremely high. No, not, not extremely high, but like pretty high. Um, so I went to my urologist, and he told me, uh, Pai, I'll have to get you to go through a biopsy, uh, just to be sure. Okay, we do not know. Uh, high PSA readings may mean uh, cancer, but it might not mean cancer. There might be some other explanation uh, of it. So I went for my first PSA reading, and uh, sorry, for my first biopsy, and they didn't find any cancer. So I was very uh, happy because of that outcome. But then the next year, when I went for my annual checkup, my PSA readings were still high. So my urologist uh, subjects me to a second biopsy. So you're looking at me here today, a survivor of two prostate uh, biopsies. Um, and I am happy to say that in those two biopsies, they didn't find any cancer. And I'm very grateful to God. And eventually, my urologist tells me that your high PSA readings is because you have an enlarged prostate rather than any threat of cancer. So uh, I give you uh, allowance to have a bit of a high PSA reading pie, but, but that's okay. As long as you're within a certain limit, uh, that's okay. Now, when you are put to a prostate biopsy, and especially when you feel that you are this invincible, healthy, middle-aged male, okay, it makes you start to wonder about the fragility of life. And it put my faith to the test. Okay, and I preach about it. So do I live it? Do I actually live it? So I have to say that since that time six years ago, I'm learning to develop the uh, habit of viewing each day as a gift from the Lord. And viewing each meal that I partake of as a gift from the Lord. However, sometimes I forget to thank the Lord when I partake of the food, especially last week when I gouged on my Malaysian chicken curry and rice. Um, uh, but by and large, I, I try to thank the Lord every day that each day is a gift from God and each meal is a gift from God. Now, here is a meal that the Lord has established for us. And it is more than just a mere meal. And it is not a meal that says to us, eat, drink, and be merry, and forget about tomorrow. No, it's not a meal that says that to us. It is a meal that is traditionally called the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. I like to call it Jesus' meal. Because when you look at the history of this meal, and if you read the scriptures, you find that this meal starts on the night before Jesus is betrayed and goes to the cross, and it's a common Passover meal. And it's a common Passover meal uh, which Jesus says to them uh, that this meal is going to be important from he, for you from now on because it, it symbolizes certain truths, certain truths uh, of my impending death, but also certain truths uh, that you will take with you as you go on through life until I come again. So i like us now to read what Paul writes about this meal in the words of institution that Paul has given to us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, because it is an important passage for us to really grab hold of the reality of this meal which we are about to partake of. So let's read together 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, 
he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's the, the key uh, verse that I want to, us to focus on this morning. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a meal with a purpose. It is a meal with a purpose because uh, it is a meal that makes us look back. It is a meal that makes us look back to the reality of Jesus' death on the cross, that he gave his body for us on the cross, and his blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sin. And so in some ways, when we partake of this meal, it is kind of an enacted sermon of the cross. Because when we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we are remembering, in fact, it's in the words of institution, we are remembering that Jesus died to save us. But it's also a meal that looks forward uh, into the future. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the in-between meal, if you like. This is the meal that reminds us that uh, we live in the time between uh, Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. And, and, and yesterday, we kind of had a kind of a, a family uh, meal yesterday too because uh, we took uh, our daughter uh, Esther back to, to London where, where she's studying now. Uh, but there was kind of like she went to university, kind of a, a first coming, if you like, okay? But when we took her back, uh, to London yesterday, we had to go to this Chinese restaurant that I wanted to try, and we partook of that meal, okay? But in some ways, it's kind of a meal yesterday when we ate with Esther in London. It's a meal that forecasts about our Christmas dinner, the coming meal, okay? The coming meal where we'll be all uh, together again. And so therefore, this is in some ways a family meal. It talks about the reality of a bigger family than any of us are part of. Um, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The we is important. Uh, last week at children's prayer, I told the children that this hall here is 149 years old. Can you beat that? For 149 years, People have been meeting in this hall and been enjoying this meal together for 149 years. And some of them have come and gone. Okay? And we are the people of this generation who partake of this meal. And in some ways, you know, when I uh, saw our, our, our uh, friends put up the banners and the garlands and everything, it kind of reminds me of a family dining room, okay, for Christmas, for the Christmas dinner. You put up the tree here and there, you put up the nativity scene, you put up some portraits, uh, you know, whatever it takes to remind you of Christmas. And I believe that there is a purpose to us having this kind of meal on the first Sunday of Advent. It reminds us of those who have gone before, like the 149 years of sharing this meal in this room. But it also reminds us of the meal to come. The meal to come in which when we go home to be with the Lord and when Jesus comes again, we'll have this profound meal with Jesus. And so therefore, uh, I'm going to end now and we are going to move into the, what I call sermon number two. Uh, we're going to move into sermon number two because we're going to, first of all, do a hymn of response and then do the offering because the offering is actually uh, an identification of the one mission we have of, of God's family. And then we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed and then we're going to have the choir minister to us 
And then we're going to sing the great prayer of thanksgiving, which has been in existence for 400 years, the, this great tradition of the prayer of thanksgiving. And then we're going to uh, refer to the words of institution, and then we're going to share in this meal together. And to me, I feel that this whole package, if you like, is sermon number two. Okay, so let us prepare for the great family meal together. Let's pray. So thank you for all the Christmases of our lives. And thank you that each Christmas is a reminder that Jesus has come. And thank you for uh, this meal, because this is the meal in between, in between the first coming and the second coming. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So now, Lord, as we go into this period of focusing on the sacrament of the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper, as our church uh, teachers tell us, we pray, Lord, that we will remember that this meal reminds us of the backward look, that we look back towards the cross, but we also look forward towards the second coming when Jesus comes again. So impress that on our hearts, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name.